to begin, I want to just acknowledge uh, we, that, we are in a quorum oh, call. Might I ask the quorum call be suspended? Without objection. Thank you. I do rise for multiple um, purposes. The first is to acknowledge that earlier this week on Monday the 12th, we marked the historic bicentennial of diplomatic relations between the United States and Mexico. Our two countries share a 2,000-mile border and extensive trade, security, economic, cultural, and familial ties. Our cultural ties are particularly deep. 40 million Americans have Mexican heritage, many of whom are proud residents of Virginia. People of Mexican origin represent nearly 60 percent of our nation's Hispanic population, and 2 million Americans live in Mexico. These people-to-people -people ties are invaluable. The two countries share an important tradition of democracy, and those traditions require consistent work and maintenance to ensure strong and independent institutions, rule of law, and democratic freedoms. We know that upholding democracy in both our nations isn't always easy, but it's a vital endeavor and it's the bedrock of our partnership. As we celebrate the bicentennial, it's crucial that the Senate and the United States government as a whole continue all efforts to advance this relationship. I want to commend the Biden administration for working side by side with Mexican leaders and taking on the many challenges we face together. This is exactly what we should be doing with such a close neighbor and partner, and I'm committing to continue to support these efforts through my role on the Foreign Relations Subcommittee over the Americas, which I chair. Through the high-level economic dialogue, the high-level security dialogue, the North American Leaders Summit, and innumerable local and national engagements, the U.S. and Mexico have worked more closely in addressing our shared priorities. We've got to ensure that the future of U.S.-Mexico relationship continues to be grounded in shared prosperity, the protection of fundamental freedoms that are so important to both of our people. So, Mr. President, I thank you. I'll have a more formal and detailed statement on the bicentennial that I will have submitted for the record. Um, now, Mr. President, if I may continue, I want to rise to, together with my colleague from New Hampshire, Senator Shaheen, seek consent to advance the nomination of a friend, Dr. Gita Rao Gupta, for Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues. And I'd like to ask if I might yield time uh, now to my colleague from New Hampshire, Senator Shaheen. The Senator from New Hampshire. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to my colleague from Virginia, Senator Kane. Um, I'm really pleased to join you on the floor in support of Dr. Gupta to be Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues at the Department of State. This isn't the first, sadly, this isn't the first time that I've come to the floor to raise Dr. Gupta's nomination um, here with our colleagues in the Senate, but also with our colleagues on the Foreign Relations Committee. I have to admit, Mr. President, that it's disappointing to still be standing here trying to convince my colleagues that women's rights matter. They matter whether they're in the United States, in Afghanistan, in Iran, in China or in Venezuela. Partisan obstruction should not prevent a qualified nominee from undertaking the necessary work of the ambassador at large for global women's issues. And, and I have to be honest, it feels to me like what's at issue here is more than just the Office of Global Women's Issues. It feels like the members of this body don't understand the role of that office and think that any time there's something that has women in the title, that we must be talking about reproductive rights. Well, that's not what the Office of Global Women's Issues does. Reproductive rights are not part of that office. And it's disappointing that we are here still debating whether we're going to put an ambassador into that office when for the last since the beginning of the Trump administration, we've only had about a year when we've had an ambassador at the Office of Global Women's Issues. You know, I, I would say to my colleagues across the aisle who are worried about Dr. Gupta's record, to meet with her, sit down, talk about um, what she would prioritize as ambassador for global women's issues. They should request a briefing with USAID's Office of Global Health because that's where their work is done to address women's health care. And what USAID's Office of Global Women's Health, of Global Health has done is it reduced maternal deaths by 30 percent annually. It saves the lives of 1.4 million children under five each year. And it decreases 
Let me repeat that. It decreases the number of abortions, particularly unsafe abortions that happen around the world. But that's not what the Office of Global Women's Issues does. I hope they won't continue to hold up Dr. Gupta's nomination because they don't understand how women's health is supported by the United States government or which offices do the work that they object to. The Office of Global Women's Issues is charged with advancing the rights and liberation of women and girls around the world through our U.S. foreign policy. It endeavors to empower women and eliminate barriers that prevent them from achieving equity and equality, particularly economic equity and equality. So not only does the Office of Global Women's Issues prioritize policies and programs to advance the status of women around the world, and ensures that U.S. policies incorporate a gender lens at all levels of policy and decision making. And now, more than ever, we need an office that's charged with leading U.S. policy on women, because around the world, what we have seen as the result of the last few years of this pandemic is that the gender gap has grown. Girls are dropping out and staying out of school at a higher rate than boys. The female labor force participation rate has declined, with women holding less secure jobs and taking on even more unpaid child and housing labor than before the pandemic. Gender-based violence has increased to such an extent that UN Women, the UN body charged with advancing the rights of women globally, now warns of what they're calling a shadow pandemic of violence. These are issues of consequence to half, more than half, of the world's population. They need a champion in our U.S. foreign policy. They need Dr. Gupta. Gender equity, equality, and the empowerment of women and girls must be a focal point of U.S. foreign policy. And that's exactly what the ambassador at large is intended to facilitate. And the reason it matters to our foreign policy is because what we know is that when women are empowered, their families are empowered. They give back more to their families and their communities than men do. And societies that empower women are more stable societies. These are issues that we need to pay attention to. We need someone in that role who's going to pay attention to those issues. And that's what Dr. Gupta would do if she is approved. So, Madam President, Senator Kane, that's why we're here again on the floor in support of Dr. Gupta's nomination in hopes that our colleagues on both sides of the aisle, but particularly our Republican colleagues, will recognize what the Office of Global Men Women's Issues does and understand that it's not the office that is working on reproductive rights for women. Madam President. Senator from Virginia. In just a second, I will make the motion the, uh, for unanimous consent. Before I do, I just want to say this nation has a bipartisan track record of fielding fantastic women diplomats. Secretary Clinton, Secretary Rice, Secretary Albright. And so this is something that we do well, and, and we've done well in a bipartisan way. Um, my colleague from New Hampshire talked about what this important position does and what it doesn't do. I just want to say a few words about Dr. Gupta. She's a nationally recognized leader and expert on women's contributions to economic prosperity and stability. She has over three de decades of experience in research, policy formulation, advocacy, and the implementations of policies and programs to empower women and girls. That includes five years at UNICEF and a decade as the president and CEO of a U.S.-based research institute. She's taken throughout her career an evidence-based approach to demonstrate again and again one irrefutable fact. Investing in women is one of the best tools to promote economic development and stability. Because of her strong reputation, because of the importance of the role, because of the fact that this is not a position that deals with some of the issues that often cause controversy on the floor, reproductive rights, I now move to the following. I'd ask unanimous consent that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee be discharged and the Senate proceed to the following nomination, PN 1578, Dr. Gita Rao Gupta, to be United States Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues, that the Senate vote on the nomination with no intervening action or debate, 
that the motion to reconsider be made and laid upon the table, that no further motions be made in order to the nomination that any related statements be printed in the record. Is there objection? Reserving the right to object. Senator from Oklahoma. Madam President, thank you. So let me clarify what this motion is. This motion today is to ask for unanimous consent of all 100 senators to be able to move a nominee through the process. A nominee that when she came through the Foreign Relations Committee, every single Republican opposed. Every one of them. It seems the frustration here doesn't seem to be with Republicans. It seems to be with the Democratic leader, quite frankly. This nominee was brought to the committee last year and then was voted out of the committee in July of this year, but has never been brought to the floor for a vote. Never. Instead, it's been a try to do a unanimous consent when my colleagues full well know that every single Republican on the Foreign Relations Committee opposes this nominee. And now the request is, now that you oppose her in committee, now consent on the floor to be able to support. That's not, that's not gonna happen, obviously. Now, we've not blocked a vote. If the Democratic leader wants to be able to bring this nominee to a vote, he's had plenty of opportunity to be able to do that and still has opportunity to be able to do that. No one's inhibiting a vote on the floor. What we oppose is, what's being pushed onto us to say, now unanimously consent to someone you know you don't agree to in the first place. It has also been interesting on in this conversation to say, this nominee has nothing to do with reproductive rights, has nothing to do with it. I've heard that from my colleagues. It's fascinating to me that Planned Parenthood put out a statement in strong support of this nominee and specifically stated in their release, because she'll speak out on reproductive rights for women globally. So either Planned Parenthood is not telling the truth or something else. So it, it is interesting when we get into this dialogue to say, okay, let's just have the vote on it and allow everyone to be able to speak out. We have a disagreement on this nominee, but it is the right of the Democratic leader to be able to bring who he chooses to the floor for a vote of any time. But I would say as one Republican of many, please don't ask me to unanimously consent to someone that we have a philosophical difference with. So with that, I object. Objection is heard. Madam President, might I, uh, in Senator response to my co colleague, might I modify my request? Um, because certainly someone should have the right to vote no if they want to vote no. So let me modify my request. I would ask unanimous consent that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee be discharged and that the Senate proceed to the following nomination, PN 1578, Gita Rao Gupta to be ambassador at large for global women's issues, and that the Senate vote on the nomination at a time to be determined by Senate leadership. Is there objection? Reserving the right to object. Senator from Oklahoma. I, I would say to my colleague uh, that obviously I'm not in the position to be able to make a decision for all of my colleagues at this moment whether that's an acceptable. That's something we should discuss with the uh, ranking member of the Foreign Relations Committee and with the uh, Republican leader uh, and allow our conference to be able to have that dialogue if that's an acceptable thing. And so at this point, I would object uh, just saying I'm not in a position because I'm not going to try to speak for the ranking member of the Foreign Relations Committee who voted unanimously in, in opposition to this nominee. Madam President. Objection is heard. Senator from New Hampshire. Will my colleague yield for a question? Absolutely. I, I think perhaps I wasn't clear because when I said I didn't talk about Dr. Gupta's position on reproductive rights for women. I talked about the role of the Office of Global Women's Issues. Um, when I supported Kelly Curry, who was nominated by President Trump to be the head of the Office of Global Women's Issues, I didn't ask what her position was on choice. I asked her what she was going to do if she took that role. And she had a, an excellent history of working on issues that matter to women and foreign policy. And because that's not the agency that's charged with women's reproductive health in our government. I didn't think that should be the basis on which I judged whether she was the appropriate person to take over that role. And sadly, what seems to have happened is that because Dr. Gupta personally says she is pro-choice, those 
all of the anti-choice organizations have made her nomination an issue. So I, I would ask my colleague, have you sat down with Dr. Gupta? Have you asked her what she would do in her role if she's approved to be the head of global women's issues and whether that was something that she was going to talk about or work on? I may respond to my colleague as well. Senator from Oklahoma. Uh, in, a, in a colloquy in the, in the conversation. Actually, I have not actually. The members of the Foreign Relations Committee, as, as you serve faithfully uh, in that role on that, uh, that's not a committee that I serve on, but I do know all the members that are Republican members of the committee. I've had the opportunity to be able to either sit down with her personally or to be able to go through all of those notes. I know how she came through the committee and without any Republican support at all, and I know the different statements that have been put out, both by Planned Parenthood and very strong uh, statement in support of her, specifically on the issues of, of women's reproductive rights. Uh, that seems to say at least somebody is saying this role is going to take on that issue, uh, but that's not a committee that I currently serve on, but I do know those well uh, that do. Um, I, I would just say to my colleague, having sat through those hearings, which my recollection is only one or two Republicans on the committee showed up, and that most of the people who I talked to had not actually talked to Dr. Gupta, didn't actually know what the Office of Global Women's Issues does. And it's very disappointing that they're going to make, make a decision based on a press release from Planned Parenthood, as opposed to looking at what she would actually do in that role and, and the responsibilities of that office. So I, I'm, you know, you guys think that every time you see women in the title, as I said, we're talking about reproductive rights. That is not the case. There's a lot that women do besides having babies. I yield the floor. Senator from Oklahoma. Madam President, I would, I would affirm again as a, as a husband and as a dad of two daughters and as someone who's very passionate about global women's issues as well, I am fully aware that women do a lot more than have babies, regardless of health and human services currently using the term birthing people and menstruating persons, which, again, I find offensive in the process as well, that this is a, 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 a group of people, half the population of the earth, that's made tremendous contributions, including in my own life and my own family. I would simply just ask the question, this is not a nominee that we're going to give unanimous support to, but I'm unsure why the Democratic leader hasn't scheduled this vote now for months on the floor when there's been months that we've been in session, but it's yet to be scheduled for a vote. Madam President. Senator from Virginia. I said I was rising for multiple purposes and now my third purpose, but I would seek consent to speak. I know we have a vote called at five for about five minutes on uh, legislation that we'll be contemplating tomorrow. Without a Without objection. We're currently in consideration of the National Defense Authorizing Act, and the leadership is working out a timing agreement for a vote possibly on one or more amendments and then a vote on the NDAA. The defense bill is the most important thing I work on every year as a member of the Armed Services Committee, and I think the defense bill that our Armed Services Committee did with strong bipartisan support is a very strong one. The timing isn't to my liking that it took so long to reach an agreement with the House, but it is what it is. The defense bill is strong. Um, we are likely to have a vote on an amendment tomorrow on a, uh, an amendment offered by my friend and colleague Joe Manchin dealing with permitting reform. And I want to stand on the floor to express my objection not to the topic and even not to much of the substance but to one particular provision that I think is horrible policy and that will cause me to oppose the amendment. Um, do we need to do permitting reform to accelerate infrastructure in this country? We do. We do. Many of the permitting reform rules, FERC, for example, are decades old and they haven't kept up with new technologies or new needs of our population. I'm strongly of the belief that we should do permitting reform, and I've introduced my own bills going back years to make at least that permitting process work better. The amendment that we're going to be voting on tomorrow, at least as I've been told, I haven't seen the language, but I've been told it's very similar to an amendment that was, that was offered in September. It's an 88-page permitting reform bill. 85 pages are permitting reform. The last three pages are the opposite of permitting reform. What do I mean by that? 
85 pages of the bill go deeply into permitting for infrastructure, especially energy infrastructure, and propose a whole series of reforms, many of which I strongly support. Although I had no hand in the drafting of that bill, and I think I could improve it if I was involved, I would give that bill a good solid B or B plus, and I would have no trouble voting for it as an amendment to the defense bill or as a standalone bill. Um, however, the last three pages of the bill take a particular single project, 100 miles of which is in Virginia, called the Mountain Valley Pipeline, and exempts it from permitting reform. It essentially says this 85 page reform that sets up how a project should be considered and approved by administrative agencies and then reviewed by the judiciary if there are complaints about it. That's what the 85 pages does, but then the last three pages says the Mountain Valley Pipeline should be exempt from all of that, should get an administrative green light, and in a provision that I find to be both unprecedented and really troubling, it suggests that if individuals want to seek judicial review of Mountain Valley Pipeline, the current jurisdiction in the federal code, which would suggest that that suit would be heard in the Fourth Circuit, Judicial Circuit, which includes Virginia, the case about one project, the Mountain Valley Pipeline, will be stripped away from the court where it's currently being litigated, and all future litigation must happen in the D.C. Circuit. Now, never in the history of this body has Congress gone into the middle of a case and because a corporation was not happy with the rulings of the court, stripped the case away from that court and given it to another court. And I have verified that through my own staff and research since this provision came up in September, stripping a case away from a court. Now, this is my hometown court. It's headquartered in Richmond. The chief judge is somebody that I used to try cases against when I was a civil rights lawyer before I got into politics. He is an esteemed jurist. Yes, the Fourth Circuit has rendered some rulings in this case that the pipeline operator doesn't like. I used to lose cases in the Fourth Circuit. I wasn't always happy with them. But the people I represented, if you lose a case, you appeal. You don't rewrite the federal jurisdictional code to say this court can no longer hear the case in the middle of the case. If we go down this path on this project, I can see it opening a door. We will not want to open a door that could even lead to corruption. I'm a, I'm a wealthy, powerful corporation. I don't like the way the Second Circuit is ruling on derivative shareholder suits. Maybe I can strip jurisdiction away from them. I don't like the way the Ninth Circuit is ruling on employment discrimination cases. Maybe I could strip jurisdiction away from them. I get it that a big company is not happy because they have lost a case. 50% of all litigants are unhappy. Someone wins and somebody loses. But the solution is not to take jurisdiction away from the court that is hearing the case and give it to another court. That's not the solution. The solution is to improve the permitting process. There are two elements of the first 85 pages of the bill that actually help Mountain Valley Pipeline. One element would be in the first 85 pages that President Biden, the president in the bill, is allowed to designate 15 projects of national significance and then expedite them. That's in the first 85 pages. And if President Biden decided the Mountain Valley Pipeline was so important to make that top 15 list, that permitting reform could help the Mountain Valley Pipeline. And second, there's a provision in the first 85 pages that would require that on matters that come up again and again and again, the panels on circuit courts have to rotate and randomly assign and not keep the same panel. That would solve one of Mountain Valley Pipeline's professed concerns. So because I haven't seen the language yet, it may not still be final, and I would urge those pushing it, do permitting reform, but don't exempt a project in my state from the permits, don't exempt it from judicial review, don't strip jurisdiction away from my hometown court and give it to another court. I was never consulted about this. My, my constituents feel very, very passionately. Their land is being taken for this. The only way you build pipelines is to take people's land. And this is 100 miles in Virginia of people's land being taken, and this body should not greenlight a project and exempt it from permitting rules in a bill that we are saying is designed to improve permitting. With that, Madam President, I yield the floor.